Discord. All right, so let's start with, with these practice problems from the other day. Then we'll get into more resonance stuff. So start with a peroxy acid and an alkene. We know what that one does, even if it does have that obnoxiously complicated five arrows in one step mechanism for making it. We know that that gives us an epoxide, right? So after step one on A, we have the epoxide, and then we're following that up with a Grignard reaction. And our Grignard reagent is just a methyl group. So we've got basically a methyl group acting as a nucleophile. So we're going to start by making that 1,2 um, that epoxy butane. And then follow that up with a, a methyl group. Attaching to one of these two sides. So it's an SN2 process for these ring opening reactions. We settled on our final answer was, was the sterics that mattered more than the transition state character for the ring opening reactions. Methyl goes to the less substituted. So the methyl will go to the less substituted. So our final product here is gonna wind up just being free pentanol. Do you know that like the ratio between the major product and the minor for this? It's gonna differ depending on every case is gonna be unique. Every nucleophile is gonna change it. You know, so it's just know that we will have the major and the minor and be able to predict which is the major, but I'm not gonna, I wouldn't expect you, and I don't even know roughly even, I wouldn't even hazard a guess at what the ratio is um, in a reaction like this. Uh, the internet and scientific literature exists for a reason. And that's so that we don't need to memorize things like that anymore. All right, how about B? B's a little bit of a throwback there, huh? Still just one butene. What reaction is that, though? Oxymercuration, right? Which was, was that Markovnikov or anti? Markovnikov. Except it's not a true hydration either, because instead of water, we have methanol. So we're going to wind up adding methanol or a methoxy group to the more substituted carbon. So our product here is going to look like that when all said and done. Here we've got another peroxide formation followed by making a or uh, using a methyl group as our nucleophile. So we're going to make a thioether and an alcohol. 
right? We're going to put the thioether on the more substitute or on the less substituted carbon. So the alcohol is going to be on the more substituted carbon. And naming that would start to get really obnoxious, right? Those, at least those thioethers, for the most part, we just named them with with prefixes, so that'd be a methyl group or a methyl thio group instead of a methoxy group. Um, so it would be one methyl thio, two butanol. We do have a stereo center here, right? So are we going, is there going to be a preference to, these two? We didn't do any, anything that was in antio specific or stereo specific with our epoxidation, right? So we just get the racemic mixture The thing to be careful with on these is if you do happen to make with these ring opening reactions, if you happen to make two stereo centers, you're not going to make all four stereoisomers, right? You're so you're going to make one stereoisomer and it's an antiomer and it's mirror image. You're not going to make the diastereomers, right? Because it has to, depending on which side you add the epoxide to you have to attach your SN2 molecule or attack has to be from the opposite side. So you will only get two stereoisomers, not all four. And then what do we have for E? What is that sodium metal going to do to an alcohol? Deprotonate. Deprotonates it. So we're turning that cyclopentanol into an, a nucleophile. So we're just, it's basically just flipped the order from what we had before, where before for, for A and C, it showed making the epoxide as the first step and then followed up with the nucleophile. This is showing us making the nucleophile and then giving us the epoxide. So our cyclopentyl group is going to attach to the less substituted carbon. So We're going to wind up attaching our cyclopen cyclopentoxy group to carbon one and having an alcohol on the more substituted group. I lost the carbon in there. Make sure I do that right. One carbon and then the carbon that has the alcohol with the two methyls. So naming that, even though the cyclopentyl group is the largest continuous carbon chain, we'd name it based on where the alcohol is attached. So it's going to be one cyclopentoxy, two methyl, two propanol. And we don't need to worry about any stereochemistry in this case, because each of those two carbons, two active carbons, um, both have two 
identical substituents, right? Carbon one has two hydrogens that are, we can't tell the difference and carbon two has two methyl groups. We can't tell the difference. If it wasn't a dimethyl carbon that we added the, uh, or that has the oxygen out on it, then all of a sudden it would have stereochemistry and we'd have to be a little bit more careful. But as it is, we get just the one product. All right, so questions on these. Epoxides, despite looking a little bit weird and being a little bit strange in terms of their reactivity, once you make an epoxide, they kind of react the way we would expect them to for the most part. All right, so I was, I was telling Rob before you got here, Lex, that this is this lecture and this chapter, this is the last chapter we're going over. So we have a whole week and a half to get to get through it for the final. Um, it's one of the single most complicated, hardest to wrap your head around chapters. I mean, it's really the reason why we've spent spending time talking about what the orbital shapes are in HOMO versus LUMO, um, because it hasn't really mattered up until now. This chapter is going to matter. Um, when we talk about dienes, which is just what it sounds like, it's two alkenes, um, they're, the way they react is going to be based on molecular on the molecular orbital shapes. And so being able to draw, to some extent, what those orbitals are shaped like is going to play a big role in figuring out the stereochemistry for our products. Um, so here are the, the classes of dienes. We're going to wind up um, spending most of our time on these conjugated dienes um, because they're the only ones that really react differently. Alenes, the accumulated or um, dienes, they don't really react any differently than regular alkenes. They just have some weird, some weird stereochemistry because their pi bonds have to be perpendicular to each other, like CO2. Um, and isolated dienes, which is when you have, if you have two or a um, an sp3 carbon in between your two bonds, those just react like two different alkenes as well, even more so than the, the alenes. Um, the conjugated dienes though, are when things really get interesting because that resonance is going to affect things. So the, the easiest type of question I can ask about these is just what type of diene is it? Is it conjugated, cumulated, or isolated? Or is it not a diene at all. So if we look at some of these, these molecules, cis-aconitidic acid, aconitic acid, which um, in, uh, in the body that winds up being important as part of the Krebs cycle. Um, usually we don't name it as the acid because under physiological conditions, it's mostly deprotonated. Um, so it would just be referred to as um, aconitate. Um, and you, the name of the enzyme that, I'll, that always sticks in my head is aconitase, is the, is the enzyme that makes this molecule. Um, it has a bunch of pi bonds, right? So are any of those pi bonds conjugated? Looks like it like the carbon. Yeah, so these ones, like pen. All of these pi bonds down here are all conjugated, right? However, there is one isolated pi bond in here. That top acid group that I circled in blue 
has an sp3 carbon between it and the rest of the pi bonds. So the blue pi bond is not going to be able to be conjugated. There are no resonance structures for that blue pi bond. But all three of the red pi bonds are all conjugated together. There are no sp3 carbons in between them, kind of breaking things up. So how about, I'm not even sure how to pronounce that one. Osamine, maybe? The two on the left could be, or two on the right could be yeah. conjugated, and then the left is. Those, those are conjugated. This one's isolated. And cis jasmine, which you can guess what flower you're likely to find that in. I know how we'll name these compounds. We're just going to take the name of the flower and then we're just going to throw a, an ochem suffix on the end of it. All pheromones have the like mode at the end? Um, not all pheromones, um, all ketones. And actually, I would have to go look to see if a lot of pheromones are ketones, if there's crossover there, or if that's just coincidence. Yeah. So here we've got two, two that are conjugated, one that's isolated again, right? Uh, if we were specifically talking about, about the diene aspect, well, akinetic acid isn't a diene at all. Osamine is a conjugated diene that also has an isolated diene component. The jasmine is, is not a conjugated diene. It is an isolated diene, even though there's some resonance between the ketone and the um, and one of the carbon-carbon pi bonds. And then last but not least, carbone. We've got some conjugated bonds, but our diene is isolated. Carbone's that one that the um, the enantiomer, S-carbone. So R-carbone is the flavor of spearmint. Um, S-carbone is the flavor of caraway seeds and dill to a lesser extent, which those two flavors don't seem all that closely related, but this is the one that we've made in my OCHEM lab um, in a racemic mixture. And then for a year, I couldn't tell the difference between spearmint and caraway um, by, by scent because it kind of, it just like confused my brain. Um, and normally I pride myself on having a pretty good sense of smell when it comes to, to things like that. And I just, could not handle it. All right, if we want to make a conjugated diene, it looks a lot like making an a, um, alkyne, except that we don't use such a strong base. So one of the reasons why we were able to make alkynes preferentially with a double elimination over making a um, over just making a conjugated diene is the fact that uh, we were we were relying on the fact that a super strong base wants to deprotonate that terminal alkyne, right? So if we use a strong enough base, we can force it to turn into an alkyne because that's the only way you can deprotonate that base and really satisfy, or sorry, deprotonate that um, terminal alkyne and satisfy the base. 
if we use a weaker base and we want to use a sterically hindered base because we don't want it to be to act as a nucleophile, we use a, a weaker base. We actually preferentially make the conjugated diene instead of making instead of making the alkyne. Um, because the conjugated diene, despite the fact it's the same number of pi bonds, the conjugated diene is actually slightly more stable because you have that resonance. With an alkyne, there's no resonance, right? Um, so we basically had to, to use an overkill base to get it to go to the alkyne because it would rather, based on the resonance, it would rather do this. Which, this is another reason also why it's almost, you almost never see accumulated um, dienes or those alines because there's not really a middle ground. If you're going to make a conjugated, basically you have to do a double elimination with a weak base where you don't have the ability to make a conjugated diene. Like if you tried to, if you did a, used a weak base to do a double elimination on um, on a propane molecule. You can't make a conjugated diene out of propane because there's only three carbons, right? Um, but basically, you're kind of limited to, um, with these double eliminations, to making conjugated dienes or alkynes. There's not really a good way to make the alenes, which is okay because they don't really show up in nature either. They're not really very useful molecules. So other than being able to recognize them, those alines aren't going to really show up again um, just because for both synthetic and practical reasons. At this point, maybe there's re maybe people are doing research into the applications of or how to make them more consistently, but it's not in the textbooks yet. So you'll have to go to grad school to learn about that. Yeah, I mean, the history of chemistry is full of cases where it's like, well, why would we bother to synthesize that? There's no use for it and it's hard. So why bother? And then they wind up doing it anyway, just because, and then they find uses for it. So that's totally could be the case with these alines. Um, but I'm unaware of any, any significant research happening right now that in that direction. Um, don't take me as gospel on that because I also have not been keeping up in synthetic ochem research for the last, it's probably been at least five years since I really thought about it with any sort of frequency. Um, and here's, this is just the um, a figure showing that stability that you get out of, out of the conjugation. So the way that they measured this is they said, okay, well, if we took, if we took two butene molecules, and we hydrogenated them to make two butane molecules. If we normalize this energy, looked at it um, with respect to basically how many kilojoules do we get per pi bond is, is effectively what we're looking at here. Um, actually, for two pi bonds, how many kilojoules are released if, for hydrogenating two pi bonds? If they're isolated, um, or if it's like on two separate molecules, it's 254 kilojoules released when you do this. It's only 239 kilojoules released if you hydrogenate two conjugated pi bonds. So that difference there is about 15 kilojoules per mole of stability gained. You become more stable when you have the conjugated dienes rather than isolated dienes, which just comes down to that resonance that we've already been talking about. But as usual, chemists can find rather clever ways to actually put numbers and objective measures to things that are kind of subjective sounding on paper. Um, we're gonna spend some time looking specifically at 1,3-butadiene. I guess we should talk a, a little bit about the nomenclature, but it's not really all that tricky. 
instead of butene, it's butadiene. So just like with diols, you just throw a di in front of the suffix, and then you just specify where, where each of those pi bonds are. Um, one three butadiene has two different conformers that are that are pretty significantly different from each other, both in terms of reactivity. Um, and despite the fact that there's only a pi, that there's only a sigma bond that it has to rotate, it doesn't rotate freely. Um, so one three butadiene has they their view is an S cis or S trans. Because we're not talking about the pi bonds, we're talking about the sigma bond in between the pi bonds. So the S is for sigma in this case. So the sigma bond in between carbon between carbons two and three can be either cis or trans. Um, which we haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about that in a while because we at room temperature, usually there's enough kinetic energy around that any sigma bonds can just kind of freely rotate, even if it's a what they call a hindered rotation because of sterics, they're still constantly kind of spinning around. Um, however, when you have conjugated pi bonds involved, that hindrance to rotation is actually more significant. Because look at those at the orbitals that you can get. If the pi bonds that you can form when we're in those S cis or the S trans, if we make the molecule planar and all of our pi bonds can sort of line up together, you get kind of get one super pi bond. You get a resonance structure that looks basically like all of the orbitals are in phase, all those pi orbitals are in phase together. So they, you kind of get like a partial pi bond between carbons two and three. Um, and so that's why it behaves a little bit like a pi bond in terms of rotation. It doesn't rotate freely because in order to get from the S cis to the S trans, you have to break that. Right? You have to flip in order to do that rotation. You're going to have to turn two of those pi, those people um, orbitals 90 degrees to the other, which fully breaks that resonance temporarily. Once it flips over to the other side, you can reform it. So you get that resin, that positive or positive, not positive, um, that stability gained um, either way, whether it's S cis or S trans, but going back and forth between them costs you about 15 kilojoules. So it has a transition state barrier between those two states. Um, and we can we can actually measure this. This is one of the if I'm talking to Carl, Carl's teaching OCHEM next quarter is he's going to take the third quarter. And so I've been talking to him about um, uh, some of the labs, three or three or four of the weeks of labs next quarter. Um, I have written as computational labs, um, but that's partly because I have a background in computational chemistry and that we the first year that we offered this class um, was spring of 2020. Um, so there was a big push to you know, make everything digital and remote. And so making computational labs, if it's already in my wheelhouse, was really the easiest way to do that. Um, Carl does not have a background in computational chemistry um, and also does not have the drive to make everything remote because we're, you know, out of pandemic stage, the quarantine stage. Um, so you may or may not do this lab, but one of the first labs, one of the first computational chemistry labs that you do as a student or as if you're a grad student going into that field is to calculate this potential energy surface. As you look at one, one three butadiene in the S cis, and then you calculate the energy in the S trans, and then you try and find that transition state energy between the two. Um, so that is a possibility if you do any computational laps next quarter. Um, one, let me know um, at break or after class or whatever. 
Um, if you feel very strongly one way or another about computational chemistry, if you really want to avoid it, let me know. Or if you really, really want to try it out, let me know. Um, if you don't really care one way or the other and are along for the ride, that's fine too. Um, so the these two potential energy services, the, the one on the left is one three butadiene rotating, right? The one on the right is a little bit more complicated looking uh, because that's just one butene rotating around that same carbon two carbon three bond. It has a little bit more, and actually that should be CH three on the far left, not CH two. Um, is a little bit more complicated of a rotational pattern um, because you have that sp3. Those sp3 carbons are going to look a little bit differently. But what's important to note here is just the look at the size of these values compared to the butadiene. The rotational barriers when it's just butene, when it's just sigma bonds and there's no resonance, are only two kilojoules per mole and five kilojoules per mole at most between the different conformers. Um, so 15 kilojoules per mole and 12 kilojoules per mole of additional stability, that's a pretty big deal relative to these, these other numbers, um, which is we're setting the table for um, resonance really matters in these reactions when you have conjugated cases. All right, so quick review about bonding orbitals in general. Um, when we take, anytime we take two atomic orbitals and let them mix together to make a bond, they're mixing, and when I say mixing, they're just overlapping. When you take two separate orbitals and let them overlap, what you get is a linear combination of the two functions where it's kind of like a weighted average of the two functions. And the result is something that looks kind of like you smeared them together and averaged them out. Um, those bonding orbital, and that's what we refer to as a bonding orbital. A bonding orbital is approximated as um, what's referred to as an LCAL. Um, which stands for a limit, linear combination of atomic orbitals. You take the atomic orbitals, you mix them together to see if what's the lowest possible energy you can make. So it's basically hybridization on a larger scale. Instead of thinking about hybridization, sp2 versus sp3, in terms of one atom at a time, a bonding orbital is doing that same approach, but looking at mixing in an sp3 orbital from one side and an sp3 orbital from the other side, and when you mix two sp3 orbitals together, where they overlap in between, gives you a sigma bond. So a sigma bond you can think of as being two hybridized orbitals then overlapping again. So we've got sort of mixing on top of mixing happening. And by, by combining all of these different atomic orbitals and hybridizing them in different ways, we're able to combine them in a way that gives us a lower total energy for the system. And since we know, thing, we know basically that things are more stable, the universe behaves in a way that moves towards making more stable states, we can be pretty sure that this is how things actually behave. This actually happened. It seems like it's a mathematical construct, and it is to some extent, but it also is how the universe actually works. And we can be pretty certain of that because of um, the fact that the universe moves towards making things more stable as a result of that second law of thermodynamics. So, what does this tell us about pi bonds? Well, just that we're not going to be mixing together two sp3 orbitals. We're going to be mixing together two unhybridized p orbitals together to get that pi shape. Um, and the other aspect of this is if there's a way that we can combine these so that they're in phase, so that the red lines up with red and the blue lines up with blue, 
if that's a possibility and that's what's going to give us our more stable state, there's also a less stable state always um, that corresponds to, well, what happens if they don't line up? What happens if the phase, if they're out of phase with each other? And instead of getting constructive interference where you wind up with them stacking on top of each other to become more stable, you get a node right down the middle and then you wind up with this shape that's less stable than what it's, than it could be. And it's less stable than just having the two P orbitals separated from each other. Right? And so what's important to take away from this slide that we'll keep coming back to is this idea that in terms of the number of ways we can combine these P orbitals together, the more nodes you add, the higher energy it's going to get. Um, you can think of the node. The nodes are like those harmonics on a on a um, stringed instrument. The more up and down you have for the same space, we have two vibrations on the same string. The vibration that has more nodes or more up and down. It's going to have a higher frequency. It's going to be a higher energy vibration. Even though they both have the same um, total distance to work with, the, the every time we add a node, that could be better. It's supposed to be symmetrical. You can see every we added a, a second node in the middle. And that shortens the wavelength even further. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. And the way we can think about it in terms of, of these orbitals, there's, there's two ways to think about it. One, more nodes is higher energy. It's just the same logic. The other way you can think about it with these atomic orbitals or these bonding orbitals is more curvature means higher energy. And more nodes means more curvature. But if you've ever wondered why an S orbital is lower energy than a P orbital, which is lower energy than a D orbital, an S orbital doesn't have any nodes, a P orbital has one node, a D orbital has two nodes, a D orbital has more curvature, and therefore it's higher energy. Um, and in terms of Every, everybody's taking calculus, right? Some, a little bit. Um, the curvature of a three-dimensional shape is kind of like taking the derivative of it, right? So you actually, one part of the ways that we calculate the energy of these different waves, of these different orbitals, is by taking the derivative of the function that gives us the shape of the wave. And because when you take the derivative of it and get the curvature for the entire shape, that's proportional to the energy of that wave. So we can actually back out the energy. This part of what the what um, um, part of the time independent Schrodinger equation, which is if we take it, has anybody taken um, the modern physics? Has anybody taken not not yet? So you, you won't get out of actually running some of these calculations for a particle in a box um, when you take that with, with Bruce or Kathy. But in chemistry, we write the simplified version, which is the Hamiltonian, which is an operator of the wave function, which is the sum of all of the atomic orbitals put together, is equal to, is defined as really, um, finding the energy of a function, the energy of the system as a function of the wave function itself. And that Hamiltonian has four pieces to it, one of which is the curvature of the orbitals. It's basically, the, it's referred to as the Lagrangian, Lagrangian. Uh, which is represented with or the gradient in three dimensions, which is so basically 
sum up all of the curvature for the entire shape. And that's going to be one of the components of the total energy of the wave function. All right. Um, in general, we don't need to worry about the antibonding orbitals for sigma bonds because sigma bonds, the more stability you get forming a bond, the bigger the difference in energy between the bonding orbital and the antibonding orbital. So sigma bonds in general are so stable that we don't really need to worry about the antibonding orbital unless we have some other reaction sort of stabilizing it. Um, so we wind up with this mattering more for pi bonds because those orbital energies are closer together. It turns out the more pi bonds you have conjugated, the closer and closer the bonding orbitals to the antibonding orbitals get. Um, but this is one of the reasons why, if you look at um, the molecules that are responsible for things like Dayglo dyes, or a lot of dyes in general, but pretty much any dye that will fluoresce under a black light, under a UV light, is made up of a bunch of conjugated pi bonds. And the size of those conjugated systems, the more pi bonds you add, the closer the gap between the HOMO and the LUMO. And so that, that means we can actually tune the wavelength of light given off by just extending, adding another, another conjugated pi bond to the system is one way you can change the color of a dye or the color of a, of a um, LED is by just tweaking that a little bit. So those, those OLED displays, um, that was always where LEDs were going to wind up because it's so much easier to tune the wavelength of light of an, of an organic molecule than it is an inorganic molecule. What they were doing with LEDs that were inorganic was basically you were limited to changing materials entirely. Like, okay, for the, for the yellows, we can use this chromium-based dye. And for the, for the cyan, we're going to use this, um, this iron-based dye. And, but they didn't really have much ability, which is why the early LEDs, the lights didn't, the light didn't look all as pleasing to the eye. And those LED TVs weren't, the color seemed off a lot of times. It wasn't perfect color because they didn't have the ability to tune it as well. OLEDs we do. Um, and it all comes back to this. We're just using an electricity to excite them to the higher level. And when they fall back down, it gives off it emits a photon like we've seen before. And if we can tweak what that distance is by adding more pi bonds, that's a pretty useful feature. Um, so here's an example of what happens when we start conjugating these. If we have four p orbitals that we can line up together, then there's four ways that we can arrange them. We can have so that there's no nodes, which is gonna be the most stable orbital that we could have. We could have an orbital configuration where there's one node. So in other words, it switches the phase halfway through the molecule, halfway through the pi system, I should say. We can have two nodes and it doesn't split it evenly into thirds because we have four, four p orbitals. And so it's not gonna put a node squarely in the middle of a p orbital you have to put those nodes sort of in between the p orbitals and that still gives us one good pi bond in the middle right and then there's we could have them alternating phase every single time we could have three nodes we can't really have more than three nodes for this there's no way we can arrange these four orbitals to be higher energy than alternating every single p orbital um, so if we want to know what the shape and the phase of the molecules is going to be for a conjugated pi system, we start by just writing, okay, well, how many atoms do I have in this pi system? 
and draw that many P orbitals. And then you, you draw all your combinations, no nodes, one node, two nodes, three nodes. If it was a larger system, if it was six P, um, P orbitals, your lowest energy would still be no nodes. And then your second lowest would be one node right in the middle. And your third lowest energy would be two nodes. You basically, and then what you do is just like filling up these orbital energies when we were first learning how to do electron configurations, you start at the bottom in terms of energy and you start putting electrons in it, two electrons per orbital until you run out of electrons. So for one, three butadiene, we have four electrons that are part of the pi system, right? We're basically gonna ignore the sigma bonds for this one. When I say how many electrons we have, we I mean how many electrons are in the pi system. We have two pairs of electrons in the pi system, right? So these two orbitals are the ones that are occupied, the lowest energy ones. And the higher energy orbitals are our antibonding orbitals. And the ones, if you have more bonds than nodes, it's a bonding orbital. Write that up here. More bonds than nodes means it's a bonding orbital. Which means conversely, if you flip that, if you have more nodes than bonds, it's an anti-bonding orbital. And just a reminder, if these if these bonds are pi bonds, the anti-bonding orbitals, we refer to that as it's a pi antibonding orbital. So you call um, just do pi with an asterisk it means it's an um, an antibonding orbital. A lot of times you'll just see that referred to as pi star um, verbally. If I was just saying that, I wouldn't say a pi antibonding orbital every time. If I'm talking to other people that are used to thinking like this, I would just say the pi star orbital. All right. Let's do, let's finish this thought and then we'll take our break. Um, the difference in character between those bonding orbitals and anti-bonding orbitals is why those conjugated systems matter. Um, and they refer to those, it turns out that almost across the board, the most important orbitals chemically and, and electronically in terms of like what wavelength of light will be absorbed are going to be the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied tend to be the most important orbitals because those are the easiest to move electrons back and forth between. And so, And so the highest occupied is referred to as the HOMO. And the lowest unoccupied is the LUMO. So a lot of, if we wanted to know what wavelength of light is likely to be absorbed or emitted by a molecule, a lot of times you, you can just look at what's referred to as the HOMO-LUMO gap. What's the difference in energy between the HOMO and the LUMO? Because that's the wavelength of light you're going to need to bump an electron up from the HOMO to the LUMO, to the LUMO, excuse me, um, which also tells you what wavelength of light will be emitted when an electron drops from what was the LUMO back to its ground state. Remember, ground state just means it's lower, lowest possible configuration. When something's in an excited state, it'll fall back to the ground state if you let it. And in doing so, give off electron or um, a photon. Right? And so those two orbitals are also referred to as the frontier orbitals. 
um, which I don't know how that term was, how they arrived at that term, but it kind of makes sense if you think of the frontier as being the area where you don't have people or where the, the interface between unoccupied land and occupied land, the frontier is where those two meet, right? Um, and so this is one of, um, Kenichi Fukui is one of the first um, Nobel Prizes that didn't go to a um, American or a European was um, Fukui. And he actually did his research about 30 years before this in 1951. Um, but it took the Nobel Prize Committee and America and Europe um, that long to get over the whole, you know, World War II and genocide thing um, and stop blaming Japanese for, for that so much. So whereas usually the gap between your research and winning a Nobel Prize is between 15 and 20 years, um, for him it was almost double that, um, partly because he worked, he did chemistry research for the Japanese military during World War II, and it took a long time for for people to be okay voting for a Japanese scientist who participated in the Japanese war effort. Um, side note, if we get far enough in this lecture today, this is the, I think this lecture has more Nobel Prize winners in it than any lecture we've had since we talked back in Gen Chem about Nobel, about um, you know your intro to quantum mechanics. Um, we talked about Bohr and, Eis and Heisenberg and Fermi and all those, all those folks. Um, we get, and it's just three, but getting three Nobel prizes in uh, in one lecture is pretty, it's pretty good. All right, so let's take a break. Let's come back at ten after, and we'll get into how does this actually matter and how is it measured. Thinking like in phase versus out of phase, it just has to do with like its respective energies. Kind of. Excited electrons are. So I'm going to be careful how I describe this because this was confusing to me for a long time. Um, we use color in these diagrams or shading to indicate phase because we're trying to not use things like plus and minus. It really is a plus and minus, but it's not plus and minus like charge. It's not plus or minus like, um, you know, there's an electron there or there's not an electron there even, or a spin. It's not, it's even unrelated to spin. It's not even related to direction. Um, it's a plus and a minus in a dimension that we don't have a good macroscopic analogy for, like spin, really. You have spin up, spin down. You can have in phase and out of phase, um, but we don't want to use direction or charge represent that so we use color um, and basically it's just like if you have waves that are out of phase um, if you have two waves in on the ocean running into each other when they run into each other there's a possibility if you have two peaks hitting at the same time the wave doubles in size but if you have a peak and a trough hit at the same time they average out to nothing you get that destructive interference that's similar to what happens here. When their phase is the same, that's like both two peaks hitting each other at the same time. You get constructive interference. That's a bonding orbital. But if they're out of phase, they cancel each other out, basically. But if it's same, but if we bumped up from like, from the, um, from like the ground state to the out of phase mm -hmm. with a node mm -hmm. just by like adding energy to it. Yeah. Okay. okay. So and the, the easiest way to do that is to shine light on it. Yeah. Okay. Because light transmits that the right amount of energy. If you shine light that's the right wavelength that has the right energy per photon, that photon basically just gets absorbed and turned entirely into one electron is in a higher state now than it was. And so now that is one of the ways, one of the reasons that light can act as a catalyst in some OCHEM reactions 
is because, and actually we saw this with the, um, with free radicals, with sigma bonds, right? Peroxides do this, where you have, you know, an OH here and an OH here, they're, and they have the same thing where you've got that, um, where you've got a bonding orbital forming between them, and then an anti-bonding orbital that's unoccupied. So here's our sigma star, here's our sigma. If you sh all you have to do is shine the white right wavelength of light and you bump an electron up here. And now you have just as many electrons in anti-bonding orbitals as bonding orbitals, right? Which means that you actually don't have anything holding those two oxygens together anymore. And so this is how free radical, that's how that homolytic cleavage happens and why light is the catalyst is literally just certain bonds, their, their homo lumo gap between their sigma bonds and their sigma star antibonds is such that you can shine visible or UV light on it. And that's enough to split those molecules apart. Um, if it's a pi bond, you still have a sigma bond holding things together. And so pi, pi bonds don't, the whole molecule doesn't fragment the same way but it's the same process. You're basically like counteracting a pi bond and turning it into a, a pi anti-bonding orbital by shining light on it. So when they're in the anti-configuration, it's just the sigma bond keeping them together? Or... Basically, um, unless it's a conjugated system, because if you look here, going from the homo to the lumo, you still have a pi bond. It's just between carbons two and three instead of between one and two and two and two and or uh, one and two and three and four, you still have a pi bond in there. Um, so if you were able to put an electron all the way up to that highest energy, even higher energy light, you could get it to fall apart even more. Or if you measured what the, you know, if we did the same thing with the sigma bond as well, which is why high enough energy light can basically fragment any organic molecule. Because if you shine enough light of the right wavelengths, you can basically throw all of these electrons into anti-bonding orbitals and the whole thing just sort of falls apart. The UV. Right? That's why when that's why UV light winds up being UV it UV light causes cancer. It, it winds up causing a reaction in your DNA specifically in, in it's a very specific reaction usually. You have two T's next to each other in your genetic code and the right wavelength, the UV light shines. You can wind up those two T's sort of fusing together to make one nucleotide. It's not even a nucleotide. It's, you get one sort of covalently attached piece that RNA polymerase or DNA transcriptase doesn't know what to do with. And it just basically stops. Um, but you can, if you took it even further, if you got up to like gamma radiation and even higher energy stuff, you can basically just wind up with these molecules falling apart if you hit them with the right wavelength of light. Um, and it's all because we're putting electrons into these anti-bonding orbitals in a way that there's not enough cohesive bonds left to counteract all of the anti-bonding energy.
see the list of them. And he's like, yeah, there's all these Nobel Prize winners in this chapter. I'm like, oh, <laughs> Yeah, too many uh, smart people. Too many smart people. So excited for the new offices and labs. Yeah. Uh, they're they're in there doing touching up paint and well, installing finishings and stuff like that. When's the initial move in there? During spring break. Um we're gonna wait, we gotta wait till I guess we don't have they're gonna start packing up things from the lab pretty much during finals week, pretty much now. Um we're starting to keep an eye on things. And then we'll actually do the move during spring break because they, they also have to do things like we're, we're reusing the same DI water system that's already installed over there. So they have to wait till we're done with it over there and then they can come over here and install it over here. But then, yeah, all of our um, the offices, I think they're just doing final coats of paint and then they have to just bring in furniture. Then we'll be able to start moving in. So that'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Never had an office with a door on it. Yeah. All right. So thermodynamic versus kinetic control. We've been doing a lot of practice with that in lab, right? Um, the, one of the reasons I didn't, I don't mind spending so much time on that is because it's an idea that keeps coming back. Um, and it winds up being pretty important here when it comes to um, doing addition reactions for um, for conjugated pi bonds, for conjugated dienes. We actually have a classic case of kinetic versus thermodynamic control for these reactions. If we do, if we look at what happens to these, these uh, reactions at zero Celsius, we wind up with the major product behaves just like with an isolated diene. So you just you wind up putting the um, what's called the one two adduct, where you protonate on carbon one, and then your bromine adds to carbon two directly next to that, just like we would expect from a normal addition reaction, right? The bromine goes to the more substituted carbon, um, but overall it's a pretty standard reaction. However, we do also see, because we wind up making an intermediate here, in our intermediate, looks like this, right? Clean that up so it doesn't look like that's a Our intermediate has a resonance structure in this case. And so our intermediate is this is what gives us two possible products here. The one four adduct is what you get when it's the resonance structure, the second resonance structure that actually um, gets the bromine is the target for the bromide nucleophile. 
we see at cold temperatures, at low temperatures, that one, two adduct is the one that's favored. And it's because it has a lower transition state barrier. Because effectively your hydrogen and your bromine are probably pretty close together as it is. And so it's a little bit easier for the bromide to just jump in right next to where the hydrogen added. It's not like it's really a time sensitive thing. It's more, um, and I suppose we could relate it back to, it probably, it's probably more about the fact that of these two resonance structures, which one would we expect to be more stable? The second one, well, in terms of the carbocation though, the carbocation is more stable in the first resonance structure, right? but the alkene bond is more stable in the second one. So we have opposing variables here. And that's kind of what leads to all of these kinetic versus thermodynamic crossovers is when you have two competing variables and by changing the temperature, you can change which of those variables is more important. At low temperatures, it's more important, the stability of the resonance structure is more important because that's gonna affect the transition state energy. So at low temperatures, we see this resonance structure does more reacting than the other one. But at higher temperatures, what matters more is that we make the more stable product at the end. And at the end, this 1,4 adduct is actually more stable because you've got a more substituted alkene. And you think back to our rules of alkene stability, the whole reason for Zaitsev versus Hoffman product Zaitsev's rule was you make the more substituted alkene every time you get a chance, right? Because more substituted alkenes are more stable. So the 1,4 adduct makes the more stable product, but the 1,3 or 1,2 adduct has the lower transition state because it goes through the more stable um, resonance structure because the carbocation is more stable, making the one, two adduct. So in that case, would the one, two be the kinetically favored and the two? Exactly. So kinetically favored, and it seems backwards again, and because it seems like, oh, um, you know, rate goes up with temperature, right? So it seems like the kinetically favored product, you should see that at higher temperatures that's actually backward because the kinetically favored product is easier to get to. At higher temperatures, you have enough energy to go back and forth as much as you want, which means higher temperatures, you're gonna favor the thermodynamic product because that's one's favored if you give everything enough energy to reach equilibrium. The kinetic product is favored at low temperatures because basically you don't have enough energy at low temperatures to make it over the red transition state. You have enough energy to make it over the blue transition state, but not the red transition state. So we can effectively say we're not going to make any, and this, this effect gets more pronounced the colder you get. Um, if we did this reaction, you know, it still has to be, there still has to be enough energy for this first step to happen. which means you can't really you can't really eliminate the 1,4 adduct, no matter how cold you get it, because if you get it cold enough to eliminate the 1,4 adduct, you also are so cold that you can't make it through that first proton transfer step. And if you can't make it to the intermediate, then it doesn't matter what's thermodynamic or kinetic, right? So we can't really get much colder than zero Celsius and still have the reaction happen. Um, but if we went past 40 degrees, we could, and there, there is going to be a limit to, to how much we could favor the thermodynamic product because, and that's going to be governed by what's the, the difference in energy here at equilibrium, what's the equilibrium ratio between these two based on the difference in energy. So it's not, this is a case where there is no way to completely eliminate either product 
based on these energies, but we can favor one versus the other by doing it cold temperatures versus warm temperatures. All right, so if you, and we kind of already talked about this mechanism, um, but if you, we will be able to uh, see it in um, the textbook drawing as well. Um, it just comes back to that resonance structure on the intermediate. All right, so let's do a practice one. HBr, zero Celsius. Draw your two products and label the major product. All right, so which is the one, two adduct? That's one where they're adding right next to each other. <laughs> yes, the one on the left, red one, is gonna put the um, it's going to put the bromine directly next to the hydrogen. And so that's our one, two. Should probably keep the colors consistent. So which is favored at zero Celsius? The one, two. The one, two. The one that puts the carbocation on the more substituted carbon. So the bromine goes to the more substituted carbon. So what do the numbers refer to? One, four, four. Where you're adding the hydrogen and the bromine. So if you think of, if we say that, is carbon one for the sake that's where the hydrogen got added in both of these the one two adduct puts the bromine directly next to the hydrogen so on on the other side of the pi bond you broke the one four adduct puts it three carbons away because you have that resonance happening and it's hard you can't really make an, any generalizations about whether which one's the the 
kinetic product. You can't say that the one four is always the thermodynamic product or the one two is always the kinetic product because you have to look at your intermediates. Right, so our intermediates in this case, I'm gonna clear this real quick. If we added a hydrogen, I just picked the bottom one, but it could have been either, either one. If we added the hydrogen here, Then that puts a carbocation here. Go back to blue. So that put that gives you a tertiary carbocation in the resonance structure. We still have the hydrogen we added, so we'll still leave it labeled in red. The resonance structure that we get here puts the positive charge on a secondary carbocation and gives you a secondary carbocation. So a secondary carbocation is a less stable resonance structure, but it gives you the more substituted alkene. So here's our general rule is the more substituted alkene is the thermodynamic product. which means at higher temperatures. More substituted carbocation is our kinetic product. And if there's a difference between the two resonance structures, you can imagine a case where the two resonance structures are the same, where it's a tertiary both ways, depending on, on how the original molecule was drawn, right? In which case, you don't really have a difference between the two. Um, in that case, you're going to likely get close to a 50-50 mixture. But if you have a case where one of the carbons where you could add the bromine is less substituted than the other carbon, you're always going to have this, this mismatch. Because there, whatever, if you put the carbocation on the more substituted carbon, that means by almost, I think by definition, you'll be putting the alkene in the less substituted position. And vice versa, if you make the alkene more substituted, you're putting a carbocation on the less substituted carbon. So you always have this mismatch if there's a difference between carbon two and carbon four in terms of the substitution. Now, you, if you can imagine though, if we did the same reaction, with this molecule instead. I guess, let's make it totally symmetric. So we don't need to worry about the fact that the two hydrogens. Our intermediate in this case, looks like this, right? Tertiary carbocation and the resonance structure is also tertiary. And in this case, we're not likely to see a difference between these two. There is no thermodynamic product versus kinetic product. If there's, if there's a difference at all, it's just going to be based on sterics. <laughs> 
and it's but it's still going to be pretty close to 50 50 between the two possible places to add the bromine. But if you have a case where it's not symmetric that way, then we have this thermodynamic versus kinetic control. All right, last topic for today <clears throat> is conjugated dienes also have another class of reactions that are that are a little bit different than our standard mechanisms we've had so far. Um, if you have a reaction that doesn't go through, and this is, I think I should re redo that definition a little bit. Um, if it doesn't go through an ionic or radical intermediate and it's not all concerted, or it's not just a simple SN2, um, a lot of times what happens is you wind up with a series of electronic steps happening all at once. And those are typically referred to as pericyclic reactions. Um, and there are three major categories for these. Um, you have what's called a cycloaddition, where we make a new cyclo group. We form two sigma bonds at the expense of two pi bonds. Um, then there's what's called a an electrocyclic reaction, where this is in the electrocyclic reactions happen within the same molecule. Within the same molecule, you can have these these electrons moving around in a way um, that creates a cyclic structure. So if you have one, three, five hexatriene, it can spontaneously go through a reaction, an electrocyclic reaction, to make one, three hexadiene, cyclohexadiene. So all we did was shuffle the electrons around. We didn't actually make any carbocations or any radical, and we didn't have any SN2 reaction happening. What's that? It's sort of like resonance without having a carbocation. Right, exactly. All it is is shuffling these electrons around so that all at once, it's a little bit like the resonance you see in a benzene ring where they're all constantly moving in a circle. If you can picture instead of one pi bond moving over to make another pi bond, electrocyclic reaction is one pi bond moving over to make a new sigma bond instead. And then the last one is called a sigma tropic rearrangement, where you don't have a net change in the number of pi bonds and sigma bonds, but you can shuffle where they are. And so they're not, it's not true resonance because remember some of our rules for resonance was you don't break or form sigma bonds. So these are distinct reactions where we can see products and reactants, and we can't do that with just different resonance structures. Is there part of like an energy input? Sometimes. And sometimes we can actually, um, we sometimes we see these happening um, differently based on do we put the energy in as light or as heat? And that's when the homo and the lumo come into play. Um, the classic one, the one of these that if you take a standardized test, if you take the MCAT or the um, the chemistry GRE, um, or maybe even T's test, although that doesn't really emphasize OCHEM on the, the T's test, which is the nursing standardized test, um, the Diels-Alder reaction shows up almost every time um, because it's kind of unique as it's just like with that sharp list of oxidation, how I said, now there's a whole bunch of other class, classes of molecule or reactions like this, but this was the first. Diels Alder is similar. Diels Alder is one of the first well understood um, cyclo additions. Um, and as a result, it shows up in everything. And the Diels Alder reaction is a one step reaction that involves three pairs of electrons shuffling around. 
Um, it's referred to as a four plus two cyclo addition. That four plus two is not referring to the atoms in the molecules, it's referring to the electrons. You have four electrons from one molecule and two electrons from another molecule that are all participating in this step. Um, and the, the reactants for this, it's always going to be a conjugated diene reacting with what's called a dienophile. So just like a nucleophile, phile means loving, right? So dienophile is a molecule that reacts with a diene. And you need both of those, but a lot of times the dienophile just has to have a pair of electrons, has to have a pair of pi electrons that can react, typically as an alkene. Right, and what, what you see happening is your diene, that they're conjugated diene, you move a pair of electrons over in between the two pi bonds and then use the other set of pi bonds to make a new sigma bond. But then that leaves a gap on your bottom carbon um, that doesn't have a full valence. Those electrons come from the dienophiles pi bond. And so as a result, you, you always make a six-sided ring. And the, the net result is you break two pi bonds and move one pi bond. Every pi bond participates. Two of the pi bonds turn into sigma bonds, making the new ring structure. And the last pi bond moves over in between the two pi bonds from the, the diene. Right, and we can see we, there are ways of measuring this potential energy surface. Um, we can effectively show that this is a single step reaction. There is no stable intermediate um, in this process. So all of these are happening at once. Uh, it is reversible to some extent. If you get to high enough temperatures, just like an elimination reaction, at high enough temperatures, you favor breaking apart into separate pieces because of entropy. At high enough temperatures, you can take a, a uh, diels alder product, even something like cyclohexene. If you heat cyclohexene um, in the absence of any oxygen, because you have to get up to real high temperatures. We're trying to avoid just burning it. So in an anoxic environment, if you heat cyclohexene, you can actually get it to fragment into, into butadiene and um, ethene. But then if you let it react, if you bring the temperature back down and let it react, you'll wind up with it turning back into cyclohexene again. In general, equilibrium is going to favor the products here. Um, because you wind up, pi bonds are inherently less stable than sigma bonds, right? Because pi bonds have less orbital overlap than sigma bonds. So when in doubt, favored by enthalpy, you're always going to have the side of the reaction that has more sigma bonds and fewer pi bonds. But at high temperatures, that reverses a lot of times if more pi bonds means more separate molecules. Is the X a halogen? X can just be anything. Typically, what helps the dienophile become be a better dienophile is more electron withdrawing group. So halogens or any sort of other conjugated pi bonds, because conjugated pi bonds draw electron density away from the pi bond um, that's reacting. Uh, and we do see that this reaction, here's part of the evidence for this reaction happening all at once, is that it's stereospecific. If your dienophile is cis, your product will be cis. So, and it's not just the, the major product. 100% of the time, if your dienophile is cis, your product is cis. If it was a multi-step reaction where you made one sigma bond and then you made the other sigma bond, 
we might expect some amount of another product due to some just random rotation, right? Um, the fact that we get very, very stereospecific 100% of the time tells us this reaction happens all at once. Um, and this just, this factors in a little bit into how you draw your products. It's not that tricky. If your products start cis, your, or sorry, if your reactants start cis, then your product has to be cis. If your reactants start trans, your product has to be trans. We just switch from them being cis on the same side of a pi bond to being cis on the same side of a ring. Have a good, I think they have. Just draw it then. So that the transition states do show us why that has to be the case. If we're going to try and do this step, this reaction all at once, our transition state. has to be forming with that, that dienophile has to either be below the cyclobutadiene or above the cyclobutadiene. It's not coming in at an angle because we need those pi bonds to overlap. We need the orbitals from the dienophile to match up with the orbitals from the diene. So you have to have them sort of approaching from above or below so that the pi electrons can interact with each other. Giving those pi electrons the ability to overlap is what gives you this product. And so that means you can't have, you can't have a system where your dienophile comes in 90 degrees perpendicular to the diene, to the diene your dienophile needs to be on the same, not on the same plane, but has to be parallel so that it, come, it can either come in from on top or on bottom. Otherwise you don't get those P orbitals lining up and overlapping in a way that allows you to, to form this. There's a practice one here, but there's one more concept I wanna to get to Um, that shows up on the quiz this weekend. So the we talked about S cis versus S trans for those for these dienes, right? If we're trying to make a cyclohexane ring, a six-sided ring, four of those atoms from four of the six atoms are coming from the diene, right? So you need those four atoms to be set up in a shape, in a geometry, such that they could make a hexagon. Basically, you can't have it in the S trans configuration because again, if you had it set up like that, there's no way you can get these orbitals to overlap. You can't, and because it has to happen all at once, you can't have your dienophile, so if we had, say, our dienophiles coming in down here, we can't have these electrons reacting first, doing two of the steps, and then having the other electrons come in after it rotates around. If this is happening all at once, it has to start with them in the S cis configuration. So out of these three possible dienes, three, the, all three of these are conjugated dienes, which one's going to be the most reactive and which one's going to be the least reactive? one of these more likely to be in the S cis configuration than the others? Yeah, it's locked into the S cis configuration, right? So cyclopentadiene is, is really reactive. 
And is one of them guaranteed to be less reactive than the other two? One three butadiene on the left has a barrier to getting back and forth between S cis and S trans and Sterix favors the S trans, but it can get to the S cis, right? Can the molecule in the middle ever make it to S cis? Now, just like cyclopentadiene is locked into the S cis, the middle molecule is locked into the S trans configuration, right? Again, one more way that they were able to prove that this happens all at once, not proves the wrong word, but another piece of evidence in favor of this whole reaction happening at once is the fact that this middle molecule won't go through a Diels-Alder reaction as a diene. It'll go through a Diels-Alder reaction as a dienophile, but not as a diene. And that's trans, like it can switch over to cis. It's just not. It's just slow. Okay. And equilibrium favors it being like this, but the barrier to go back and forth was only 15 kilojoules per mole, which is reasonable at room temperature. But these other two, they can't go back and forth at all. Cyclopenadiene is locked into the more reactive configuration. And the molecule in the middle is locked into the non-reactive configuration. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is the reactivity of the dienophile. So I'm going to put on this page, not because we're can necessarily go through all of these. Um, but one of the things that you can you can see about the in each of these reactions, the dienophile is the molecule that's on the right. And each of them have have substituents attached to an alkene group, right? All of them the, the characteristic of those substituents is that they're going to pull electron density away from that pi bond in the middle. The more you can, the more electron withdrawing groups you have around that pi bond, that central pi bond, the less stable it is. In other words, the more reactive it is. So regular ethene is not reactive, is not all that reactive because it doesn't have any electron withdrawing groups pulling, weakening that pi bond. But the more you can weaken that pi bond by having other electron withdrawing groups around, which can either be halogens or can be other functional groups that have conjugated pi bonds. So all three of these have other functional groups, right? We either have an ester on, in A, a carboxylic acid on B, and ketones on C. All of them having those conjugated pi bonds mean that there's resonance structures where that pi bond in the middle is broken. And you're having electronegative elements pulling on those, those resonance structures um, mean that that pi bond is not as strong. So one of your questions on the quiz this weekend, there's a couple of, there's one or two deals, all the reactions, there's some, some review for the ethers and epoxides. Um, but then the, one of the questions just says, rank these dienes or dienophiles in terms of reactivity, which ones are going to react the best, which ones are going to react the worst. So with the dienes, it's all about how well can it get to that S cis configuration? And for the dienophiles, it's all about how much electron density is being pulled away from that central pi bond. And just in the interest of 
And we have we have one minute left. Um, we won't get to that. I don't think that that matters that much. So let's do this practice real quick. Here's another diene and diene file. What is your product going to look like? Draw these a lot of times also. So remember, we have one molecule approaching from either on top or bottom. So by doesn't really matter which way you draw it. I kind of drew the uh, dienophile as being a little bit bigger. So maybe so maybe visualize it as your dienophile. The molecule on the right is on top, is above the diene. Uh, it's kind of like tilted, so what's coming out of the board. So more like if your dyne is in the plane of the board, it's flat. Yeah. Your dyne file is coming like this. So it has to be parallel, but it can't approach side on because remember these pi bonds are sticking up and down. The pi bonds are into the board and out of the board. So to get the pi bond orbitals to overlap, you either have to bring in your dyne file from on top to lock it into place or from behind to lock it into place because you need the pi bonds to be pointed towards each other. And that's why you can't have it coming in like this because then those pi bonds are 90 degrees to each other. That won't work. It has to be like this or from behind. So if we think of, of our dienophile as being more towards us, kind of coming in to dock, like this, one of these pairs of electrons is gonna move I guess it probably makes more sense to draw it the other way, the other order. So the dienophile electrons are gonna come in here and gonna be attracted to, there's a slight partial positive on the carbons that are at the edge of the conjugated diene because your resonance structure puts a partial positive on carbons one and four. But you need to make room for that. So these move over here. But then you need to make room for that. So our other pi electrons move over here. So our product going to look like I guess it makes more sense to switch those. Let me switch those cyanide stereochemistry. So this is coming further out towards us. So the reason that I don't have great figures from, from the, that look like the ones we've seen before is because the textbook that I used to teach from doesn't have great figures here. The actual, the best source that I've found for explaining these doesn't have um, figures that are as high production value. If you wanna think of it that way, they look a little bit more homemade, um, but there's a website called Mastering Organic Chemistry. 
um, that there's some some links here. These are some some issues that we didn't get into, some variables we didn't get into that we're going to spend next week talking about um, on Tuesday. Um, but this website, Mastering Organic Chemistry, has really good deep dive into what the, the actual structures look like. And so this is kind of what I was trying to draw. This is trying to show exo versus endo, so don't worry about that now. But here's our diene. Here's our dienophile approaching from underneath or approaching from on top. And the molecule you make as a result keeps that same stereochemistry. Either both of your substituents on your dienophile are facing the same direction, so cis, or to the ring structure that you make, or they're facing opposite directions like the one we just did. But if you want extra figures showing perhaps better than I can do freehand here, um, that's a pretty good resource. And the, the more standardized way of drawing this would look like our product here, look like, let's see if we had, All right, well, went a couple minutes over to finish up that thought, but now you definitely have everything you need for the quiz this weekend, have seen it. Um, check out that Mastering Chemistry website. It's actually good for a lot of topics, um, but the one that in particular, I thought it really did way better than the text, any of the textbooks I've seen um, is the, is the Diels-Alder reaction and the stereochemistry. That's right. The E2, the E1, E2s, and S1, and S1. Oh, yeah, they have a really good resource for that. Yeah, too. Like a good chart that kind of broke down the differences. Yeah. Yeah, and that was really started by, by a grad student who 